All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Rush University Medical Center Division of Nephrology Renal Biopsy Conference for May 25th, 2023. Today's CME activity code is 488610. Um, this conference is going to be recorded, uh, and it'll be up uh, posted on YouTube shortly. I gave the link to, in the, uh, the meeting chat box on how to uh, join our YouTube channel. And, uh, and if anybody is not on the mailing list, I also put a, a, an email in there. Please send us an email. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, put you on the email uh, notices for our conferences. As usual, we have nothing to disclose. Um, and uh, patient confidentiality has been uh, very, very uh, closely maintained uh, with by changing anything, identifying, et cetera. Today, we've got an interesting case. Uh, I think it'll be a very interesting discussion. Um, we're going to take uh, some concepts to another level. Um, and uh, Dr. Baxi, this is his case. We're going to start with him uh, telling us uh, the clinical history. Uh, Prevere? All right. I'm going to share the PDF for those uh, who can't see the screen as well in the chat. Give me a second here. All right. So uh, the patient that we're presenting today is a 35-year-old woman who initially presented to another hospital for evaluation of acute kidney injury. Prior to this whole ordeal, she was otherwise healthy. Um, she denied any other medical history, wasn't taking any medications. Uh, her whole kind of illness started with COVID-19 in the winter of 2022. Now her COVID course was very mild. She wasn't hospitalized, she had mild URI symptoms, she had tested, stayed out of work for a week and was right back and didn't think much of it. But since that time, she's had multiple issues. She developed severe strep throat about one month later uh, in early 2023. And after that, she had two months of intermittent fevers and recurrent abdominal pain that was not getting better that finally brought, in her, that brought her into the emergency room. Um, so, and this is about, just to give a timeline, this is about three months prior to our current time. She had an extensive workup per the notes that we could gather. Uh, she had ID and consultation, GI consultation, and there wasn't any definitive diagnosis that was provided. It was so severe to the point where she went under a diagnostic laparoscopy for abdominal pain, and they did find that her left ovary had significant follicles and she had a tubular cyst, and this was thought to be maybe part of her pain, and so decision was made at that time to do a left oophorectomy and tubal ligation. The pathology was sent and was benign, and there was no evidence of malignancy, nothing else that um, was reported. Post-op, she really did not improve, and she was admitted again one week after this with a new pneumonia. Her creatinine at that time was 1.1, and when we go went back, uh, the baseline during this whole course was about 0.8 to 1.1, and for her pneumonia, she was sent home on a course of levofloxacin. Month later, after this, she presented the emergency room again, now with shortness of breath, continued abdominal loading and GI symptoms, but now with new low extremity edema that was worsening. Her creatinine was now up to 2.1. Her albumin was 2.4, which was previously normal, and hemoglobin was 8. They did get a urinalysis at that time that showed dipstick blood and protein with three RBCs on microscopy, 10 WBCs, and she had a, a spot urine albumin and creatinine ratio of 0.3. Renal imaging showed no hydronephrosis. Her two kidneys were of normal size. She underwent an uh, echocardiogram that showed no evidence of heart failure. She was given IV diuretics, and her creatinine didn't improve with some symptomatic improvement and with a creatinine of 1.5 in discharge. She was sent home on oral torsamide 20 once a day. Two weeks after this discharge, when you know, maybe stuff was getting better, she represented uh, again to an outside hospital with nausea, emesis, and edema. Her creatinine was now up to 2.5, her albumin was 2.1, her hemoglobin now was 6.8. CT imaging of her uh, abdomen showed significant anarsarca with ascites, and there was questionable cirrhotic appearing liver. She said because of her pain, she was taking NSAIDs at home, and she had gotten Zofran pre-RN. At, at, this is at the outside hospital. Her renal function continued to deteriorate. Her creatinine continued to uptrend, um, and finally, the decision was made to get both a liver and kidney biopsy. She had her uh, get uh, started on hemodialysis and ultimately was transferred while biopsies were pending to our hospital for further care. Um, in terms of um, past medical history, really nothing major that she said. However, on further questioning with us, she did say she had a prior pregnancy, two pregnancies. Uh, in her last pregnancy, she said she was past term and she started having protein 
um, in her urine and she delivered, uh, but she had no other complications after. Uh, past medical history, she did have a cholecystectomy and epidectomy at some point. Um, and she, of course, the oophorectomy and the tubal ligation that um, I just mentioned. She was not on any medications prior to this whole ordeal, but she was sent home on torsamide and she was using NSAIDs prior to her most recent admission. She denied any other over-counter or, or supplementation. Um, fat, family history, no kidney disease, uh, social history, otherwise really unremarkable. Her blood pressure was 130 over 90. Her BMI was 37.1. On exam, she was not in respiratory distress, but you could tell she was in a lot of abdominal pain uh, and discomfort. Uh, she also had low extremity pain. She had uh, definitely a, a distended abdomen with two plus lower extremity edema. There was no rashes. Cardiac exam was unremarkable. Um, and that was really the most important things on physical exam. In terms of labs, uh, when this is the time of arrival to our institution, but white count was 9.6, hemoglobin was 8.5. She had received blood transfusions. Platelets were 100, MCV was 30. Uh, peripheral smear was normal. Uh, iron sat 17%, ferritin 500, uh, coags were normal. Her CMP, sodium of 134, potassium of 4.9, chloride 100, bicarb 25, BUN 70, creatinine had gone up to 4.3, glucose was 100, total protein 5.7, albumin 2.4, LFTs were normal, LDH and haptoglobin were both normal. Serological workup that was initiated, uh, it showed really, you know, main things here, C3 was very mildly low. And I put the reference in for our lab range. Her CRP was elevated with a normal ESR, ANCA titers negative, other microbiology was negative, immunofixation did not show evidence of monoclonal protein, or kappa lambda ratio was 1.4. UA, as I mentioned above, uh, you know, one plus blood, some dipstick protein. Uh, this, this repeat had no WBCs, but had three to five RBCs and a UAC of 0 0.3 grams per gram. And as mentioned, renal you know, ultrasound was uh, really unremarkable. So any questions for uh, Pavir? Yeah, what was her calcium? Oh, I didn't include it. Calcium was normal. I'm sorry, I didn't include that in there. And did she have a chest x-ray that was normal? She had, by, she, uh, her chest x-ray was really unremarkable. She didn't have any lesions or anything like that. And when did she come off the levofloxacin? She came that, uh, she presented, that was a week after her uh, surgery. So that would be about um, a month and a half, two months ago. But it also was around the time her creatinine first went up to 2.2. Yes, yes. All right. Well, the predated the AKI, yeah. All right, we're going to start with a poll uh, before we uh, discuss this. So uh, poll number one, um, what do you think this patient has? Um, ETN, uh, number two, AIN, uh, again, from whatever. Uh, number three, a normal biopsy, for instance, maybe a patarenal syndrome. Uh, number four, an ankle negative vasculitis, or number five, something else. And put all your questions in the chat. Uh, um, I see uh, Prevere's answering them very quickly. The super multitasker that he is. Everybody vote. We don't know who, we don't know what you put down, so. <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, I'll give it a couple more seconds here. Yeah, it's pretty well spread out, so I don't think it's going to change that much anyway. Yeah. So we'll share the results. Okay, we've got uh, pretty pretty kind of equal. I guess the, the, the winner is, it's actually a tie between uh, AIN and ANCA negative vasculitis. Uh, in, in second place, it would be others. Um, comment in chat uh, if you want to put your thoughts in there. We'll uh, we'll get back to this um, as we discuss the case. Uh, and then third is ATN, and finally uh, we had uh, one vote for normal biopsy. Um, so I want to hand this over to uh, Dr. Gashti. Uh, Casey, can you uh, tell us your thoughts about uh, what you think is going on? Yeah, yes, I can. Uh, I think the poll 
kind of tells you that uh, it's kind of really hard to pinpoint exactly, first of all, whether this is even a glomerular disease or this is a tumor interstitial disease, there's a split between vasculitis and um, ATN, but uh, just kind of looking at the patient herself, I mean, this is a young woman that had no problems until she had COVID about uh, winter of last year, so about six months ago, and then following that, she's been having a lot of GI issues. Uh, mo mostly, most of what I hear is just abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. So there's a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms. And then subsequently, at some point after that, she starts developing, an, uh, for unknown reasons, acute kidney injury. So there is something systemic happening here. Um, so so I think it's really valid to, to do a serologic workup. It seems like everything is negative. So um, if we're thinking about a, a, a fluoroquinolone, which was brought up uh, from a timeline of initiation and when her symptoms started causing uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis or even an ANCA-associated vasculitis, it seems like the ANCA is negative. She doesn't really have a rash. Uh, so um, it's so it's it's worth thinking about, but I'm not really sure if that would be the case here. We know COVID can give you a collapsing FSGS, uh, but this was a really long time ago. And it seems if I'm reading the protocol correctly, uh, it wasn't at the time that she had COVID that, that her problems started. It was a mild COVID and all her issues started a few months later. So um, I think ATN from COVID or COVAN um, doesn't seem to be part of the, uh, uh, at least simultaneously from a symptom onset and the disease itself. Uh, lupus is always in a young woman who has a mysterious presentation. Lupus has to be considered. Uh, ANA is negative, double-stranded DNA is negative. So serologically, at least, there is no evidence of hemolysis. Haptoglobin is normal. So uh, even though it's a, it's a good thought, I feel like that's also uh, probably lower on the differential. Um, what else am I thinking about here? So her playlists are a little bit low. There are 100. Um, even though there's, you know, haptoglobin is not low. Uh, with people with abdominal pain, uh, some kind of, uh, angio you know, thrombotic microangiopathy of some sort, TTP, typical HUS, cryoglobulins, things that that would sort of block the blood vessels, uh, both kidney and, and GI tract uh, should be looked at, uh, especially with the low platelet count. So um, those are all the things that we, you know, obviously we'll do a biopsy and we'll see that, the complements being normal speaks against cryoglobulinemia. Um, and as far as, you know, uh, having some sort of a TMA of unclear etiology, that's, uh, I guess, we'll take a look at the biopsy. Uh, but at least the low platelets may support that, but the lack of uh, hemolysis may not. Um, what else is here? IgA nephropathy, um, somebody who has hematuria, perdinuria, um, C3GN, uh, those are all possibilities. I think this is a case where I think it's wide open as far as what's going on. Uh, but but the abdominal pain all after this infection. Oh, by the way, she had strep throat. So post-infectious or post-strep glomerulonephritis on the differential, again, complements are normal. But this, uh, I assume these complements were checked long after. So it could have been that, that she had maybe possibly hypocomplementemia at the time of her disease. And then these were... Um, these were checked later and they had normalized. Those are all possibilities. But because this disease has had a six-month course, it seems, I think uh, the current labs don't really point towards anything in particular from, a, you know, it doesn't, bicarb is 25, potassium is relatively normal. So doesn't seem like it's a primary tubular interstitial disease. The urine doesn't have that much act, uh, as far as uh, pyuria. So I feel like uh, ATN is actually a pretty good guess here. Uh, AIN is possible, but uh, again, not not uh, really well supported based on, you know, she got some antibiotics, so that's plausible. Uh, she has liver disease. She has this new diagnosis of cirrhosis, so hepatorenal is kind of par for course. So I think those are all pretty valid. I um, What am I going to put as my number one? Um, I think the low platelets with abdominal pain, I think some kind of a, a thrombotic microangiopathy would be um, my number one, ATN number two, and an ANCA negative vasculitis number three. I, 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 I think I'm leaving some stuff out, but I think that's where I'm going to stop.
No, that's a really, really nice uh, overview. Um, in the chat, we've got Dr. Reen talking about a COVID triggered complement mediated condition of some type. Um, it was also brought up porphyria, I guess, because of the, the anemia and the bizarre abdominal pain. Interesting thought. And then uh, uh, Dr. Pamira, renal limited TMA. A lot of good thoughts here. Um, uh, we've got some more comment comments here. Um, so, Dr. Kaza, so uh, uh, Tiffany uh, is from Arcana. It's our pleasure to um, have her join us today. This is uh, two conferences, I believe, in a row. You know, last week we had um, Dr. Larson on, and I basically both lionized him and canonized him. So, I don't know what I can possibly do to flatter you and thank you enough for joining us because I've used up about every uh, uh, thing I could possibly do. Um, we, we should knight but, her. We'll have to knight her. There we go. She's knighted. Thank you, Bill. You bailed yeah. me out. You are now Sir Kaza. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but thanks for joining us. And you uh, you want to comment on you want you put a comment in the chat. You want to uh, elaborate? Oh, I could totally be off. I just um, I was concerned that she has cirrhosis now, but in the winter had no past medical history. And I noticed that the ferritin is low. The albumin's discrepant with um, the degree of proteinuria. So. Um, further suggesting the, the liver injury. And I um, was curious if there's a, the same process is going on in the kidney, um, if there's some infiltrative process like um, IgG4 disease or HLH or, or something like that. Um, it's likely not that obscure, but I'm thinking since you have a fancy biopsy conference, it might be. <laughs> well, that's always a problem because, you know, uh, we are going to present some of the more interesting cases and it's always, you know, people tend to guess more obscurely and then and our polls they tend to guess more obscurely because of that because of the you know conference uh bias or whatever um uh dr oviera our second year fellow wrote a really she wrote po you know uh, polyarthritis nodosa and I, I think that's a really good thought because what we have here is we've had renal failure out of proportion to what's in the urine and that would be kind of a a, a thought where you could where you could actually have a lot of renal failure but not as much glomerular involvement to have that in the urine um, to see that. So I think that's a good thought. Um, Without the conference men chip or person ship or whatever we're calling it, it's, uh, you know, I, I think that it kind of reads like a lady who has these recurrent URIs and then gets abdominal pain so much so that they think that there's a surgical abdomen and then you go and take it out and you still have the abdominal pain and that's classic HSP. Right, you know these these these. There's no skin findings here, but there's, you know, a, a, a classic IgA vasculitis where you have this abdominal pain that's just not going away, and they go and try and do an appendectomy or something, and then the abdominal pain's still there, and then later you see the rash come, and someone sees that there's hematuria, and you end up diagnosing IgA. So I think that's up there, and anytime that's up there in the differential, we have to think about post strep, and anytime you think about post strep. You also you need to think about C3GN, and so I think I think a lot of those, even though there's not a lot of activity in the urine, um, are on the differential. And, and, and post strep is one of those classic GNs where you have this massive volume overload out of proportion, you know, that's completely different than you know having nephrotic syndrome. You know, it's the classic like presents like heart failure. And so again, we don't have much hematuria here, but. Uh, I think I think she's got that after the, her abdominal pain didn't go away. She has this almost serositis uh, of sorts where she has this, you know, inflammatory capillary leak type thing. And I think that could be classically seen in, in post uh, strep as well. Um, and again, anytime you're on that uh, differential, we have to think about C3 GN2 and her C3 is mildly low. It's not, you know, terrible, but that's not how you would diagnose it anyway. Um, so I think those things would be kind of a little bit uh, more classic here. Yeah, um, you know, I try to, you know, I remember from CPCs learning long ago that if you have unexplained abdominal pain, you know, you because of a CPC, you think of the zebras and, but I can't really put those together here other than what you said. I mean, you know, porphyria certainly was on the list, lead was on the list and, and Ehlers-Danlos was on the list, uh, but I don't, you know, that would be pretty bizarre. There are some renal artery lesions, but uh, associated with that, I suppose. Um, Anybody else have any comments before we uh, take a look at the pathology? Dick, what do you think's going on? I haven't got the foggiest idea. This is a real <laughs> challenge. Time, time for a I'm, I'm struck by a couple of things. She had severe anemia, 
really out of proportion to her degree of renal failure early on, which has persisted. Her sedimentation rate is almost normal and her CRP is very high. That troubles me a lot, particularly for vasculitis. To have a sed rate of only 15 with vasculitis causing, that, that would be very unusual. Uh, I, I really, it would be total guesswork. Well, you're usually good at guessing, so uh, I think uh, let's move. So, so um, normally we spin the wheel here, but this biopsy is a little tricky, and this is maybe the first time I've ever done this, where I'm not going to put this on the fellows to have to read. It's uh, it's not an easy biopsy uh -oh. at all. So uh, we're coming up with a new, uh, just for today, although this might catch on, we're going to do a new one. We're going to say, who's going to read the pathology today? It's going to be between... Dr. Gash and Dr. Whittier, and they're going to play rock, paper, scissors. Oh, my God. All right. Uh, oh, good. He, okay, here we go. Ready? Oh, wait, get us. Wait, wait, wait. Got to get you on the screen. That, can you see Dr. Gash in there? You'll have to unblur. Maybe unblur your... Um, see. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm still is... seeing... I'm not seeing them. Yeah, okay, so not go not to your button. video, you yeah, know, thing, and then uh, unclick uh, blur your background. There you go. There we go. All righty. Are you guys sick? Because all I'm seeing is the. Is oh, yeah, here. And I'm going to pin them. Hold on one second. There we go. Uh, give me a second here. All right. <laughs> go ahead. You I don't know why you singled us out. I think Corbett needs to get in here and do rock, paper, scissors. Yes. Corbett and Rocky should do this. There we go. <laughs> okay. So uh, we go. Wait, wait. We do on three or one, two, three, then go. On three. Okay. Rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. Uh, <laughs> we'll, just do, we'll just do one. Uh, right. So uh, so he wins. So I win. So I read or not read? Does he it's have up to, to you. So I think he makes, if he wins, he puts, puts me to I'm read. I'm safe. Yeah, he's yeah, safe. You're safe. I'll read. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Gone was... Forever there. Uh, at least we didn't do best out of three. Uh, all right. Let me see. I'm going to give you control of the screen. Okay, give me a second here. I don't want that to catch on. <laughs> go ahead and click okay yep you're controlling the screen at the bottom and dr uh Kaz is going to help me through this or dr uh, Simulek, or... uh david is okay. yeah i'm here bill <laughs> and before you before you do the screen i'm going to add one little differential how about lead poisoning okay <laughs> consider it added did she have gout <laughs> we never have uric acid yeah. Uh, no history of gout. Didn't have a uric acid. Okay. Saturnine gout. All right. Let's uh, roll. Okay. We've got some uh, low power cores here. This is the trichrome stain uh, highlighted by all this blue. This is probably more medulla down here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That core is medulla. Here's some cortex up here. Uh, not quite sure if that's an artery or not, but not much to say really on this power because we would expect this to all kind of be blue, but I don't think there's that much tubular interstitial fibrosis, so uh, maybe 30% or something, hard to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you have some cortex on that top core and then the far left is medulla. Okay. So what, what's there in the cortex looks, looks pretty well preserved. Okay, so not much chronicity, good, okay, yeah. uh, excellent. Okay, uh, this is a uh, higher power view of one glomerulus. This is an H and E, um, and here's our uh, glomerulus. Uh, it's, you know, I'm not sure if this is fixative or, or not, um, but sometimes we see unlysed red cells that would be here. But if this isn't a fixative issue, then yeah, it's real. It's real. Okay, well then that's you know that that to me, um, let's see, it looks like. I guess I, I, it looks like red cells to me, um, but I would say that they're not, it's not fibrinoid necrosis because it's not like the lighter shade of pink. It's a little darker. Do they look fragmented or intact? Um, well, that's a lead on if I've ever heard one. Is yeah, it... I, I mean, I guess I would say fragmented, but that's only because you asked it that way. I don't really know how I would tell the difference when I looked at it. Don't you need like a higher power? I, I can't see any fragmentation at this power, do you? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Some of those little, uh, yeah, up here the, they look. Yeah, up there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Almost looks like they're uh, sickle cell red cells or something. Is that what you're saying? 
No, no. Well, I, th I think that they're fragmented in their cystic sites. Oh, okay, okay. And and another way to tell that this is in fibrinoids, you don't see any carioractic debris. You don't see yeah. pro proliferation really. You just yeah. see this predominant um, red cells, I guess, in the capillary walls. And it would be. It looks pretty um, global. And you know, I don't know if it's in all glomeruli, but certainly it's in both of these. Uh, so it might be a diffuse process too. Um, yep. Hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, no but Bill, what about the, the capillary lumens? Um, yeah. Can you make any out? Um, right. Not, I mean, maybe something there, but not much. It's really yeah. kind of full. Is there some mesangelysis here possibly? Yes. Like, very good. Here. Like here's a capillary loop and this is a, nucleus in there but the whole thing should be open and it's kind of yeah full with this stuff is that yeah. right y yeah there's mesangelysis uh red cell fragmentation and endothelial cell swelling that's kind of a obscuring many capillary lumens um do we have a do we prevere do we have a pregnancy test as a 35 year old woman uh pregnancy was negative that's a great question okay Did you just make that up no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure she's pregnant. Uh oh, okay. we left that off the protocol. Oops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, again, more of this, um, I guess, uh, lice or fragmented red cells. Capillary loops are really, I mean, here it should be just full of open capillary loops, but instead it's full of, uh, you know, this, this, this is endothelial cell swelling. So it's not, yeah. really, and in, it's not really a proliferation or a hypercellularity. It's just that the endothelial cells themselves are, are swollen, massively blocking off the capillary loop, I think is what you're saying. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the yeah, yeah, very good. Cells too. And here's some interstitial nephritis around the outside, but uh, that might, yeah, okay. That's uh, It doesn't look like it should be from anything inflammatory in the GN. And so maybe a little focus of lymphocytic interstitial nephritis. Yeah, and here's some red cells too, and I can't quite tell if they're in a tubular or not, but uh, maybe we'll see that at a different power. Uh, okay, anything else uh, here, David? Or no, 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 that's good, Bill. Bill, you want to go back? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mario. Do you think that there is some lobular accentuation in that glomerulus? Yeah, not 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 like globally, but here's certainly a lobule, um, and. Uh, and if we're talking about a vascular mediated injury uh, long term, that can certainly lead to an MPGN pattern of injury, um, in which case we'd expect the immunofluorescence to be negative. So maybe a hint of it here. Uh, I'd love to see the, the basement membranes when we get to the Jones or something to see if there's also some double contours and see how much this mesangium and is invading into it. And that might give us an assessment of chronicity too, I think. Thanks for that pickup, Mario. Um, and this is a, uh, it's slightly different color, but I think it's still an H&E. Yeah, yeah, same, same glomerulus, higher power. Uh, okay, so here's sort of that segment again of, or lobule. Um, and here we have the same pattern there. Uh, trying to see if there's anything new here, but you know, they, there's really just like, if this were to be an open capillary loop, this is the only part of the lumen. And this is a really nice example of how this endothelial cell would not really be apparent at all on a normal H and E, and this whole thing is so swollen that it's really just making that uh, capillary loop bloodless. Yeah, very good. Uh, I haven't seen. Okay, so this is um, a PAS now, and we have two glomeruli here. And I just see no capillary loops that are open. Here's just, again, full of endothelial cells being swollen. Uh, here's another example of, of, you can see the nucleus here. And it, you know I know this isn't the best for nuclear staining on the PAS, but you can really see how this is just completely swollen and this tiny little lumen is there. Um, yeah, really and then that, I'll, that, I'll, that before you had said there's mesangelysis, uh, notice there's no clear defined mesangial areas really. Yeah, that's right. So the, yeah, the mesangium would usually be here, but it's all kind of like, yeah. like this one, another capillary loop and there's endothelial cell, cell swollen, swollen, and there's just nothing getting through. That, that loop at four o'clock almost looks MP, you know, look like a uh, inner position, that one, that big one. Yeah. 
here where I was before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, I'm uh, yeah, I just don't, see the something, something's taking up a lot of the wall there. I'm not sure if it's swelling or what, but it's very, very prominent. And then the two bills. One of the changes at one, two o'clock, you think that may be a hint of reduplication there around one uh, to here? Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. Good, uh, again, good pickup. I, uh, yeah, that's on a PS. That's pretty impressive. Um, yeah. you know, might e even... Eagle Eye Mario. That's, uh, <laughs> it might <laughs> be some tram tracking. Um, yeah, actually, next time, Mara, if you want to volunteer before the rock, paper, scissors, that would be great. I didn't hear you. Uh, I didn't hear you raising your hand at that point. But uh, thanks for thanks for, you know, piping in now. Sure. Um, <laughs> Roger, sure. to keep quiet. <laughs> I have something to bring up. Sorry. Sure. Um, so you can see the mesangium is kind of um, areas are light. And what I think you were noticing on each and &E is a lot of like flocculent. So it's kind of like foamy appearing mesangium um, and in Cape mesangelysis. So normally we would expect like in PAS to be like super eosinophilic when you have increased matrix, but you you kind of see that it that it's pale. And along the accentuation of the capillary loops, um, I I think you're mostly seeing that due to endothelial cell swelling um, and, and luminal closure as, as you were describing earlier. But yeah, beautiful image. And and the uh... And you can tell it's sort of weakly PAS positive, and it's not a staining issue because our our Bowman space here is lighting up intensely. But yet the here, which normally would be, is not quite. So uh, that's a nice, I think, contrast would be for the amateur hour here. Uh, pres you know, reading the biopsy, it can really show that it's kind of weaker here. So that thank you. Um, and there's not there's a little bit of ATN here. And I know that was in the differential, but uh, certainly that's not the overwhelming pathology that we're seeing in the biopsy. Uh, okay, we've been waiting for the Jones, and let's see. So we have, uh, uh, yeah, so here's some, uh, I would say, you know, splitting. Um, certainly this, the, again, endothelial cell, this whole thing is completely split. So we have a, a huge uh, basement membrane on both sides of this, whatever's in the middle here, I guess it would be an endothelial cell or something, but that's a, uh, that's some splitting there too. Um, so yeah, none of these basement membranes look very normal. There, there's a, there's some destruction here. Uh, that, 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 that's probably a mesangial area with okay. mesangelysis. Yeah, right there. Yeah. I mean, is there any open capillary loops? Yeah, I, I, Steve, it's a good point. I don't see much. I mean, like you know, this. I noticed that on the previous on the PAS. I mean, none of these loops are open. I mean, they're completely filled. I don't know if it's because of, you know, swelling of the endothelial cell or, I mean, it's not like there's a ton of nuclei, but I mean, I, I, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but doesn't it strike you? I mean, I thought the same, what was it, was right before this was a couple of PAS gloms, but I, the, all the lumens look completely occluded. Right. Yeah. There's nothing, there's no open space. Um, and we did a, a serum pregnancy test, right, Prevere? It wasn't just that you... <laughs> I promise. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, all right. So this is a, uh, this looks like vascular smooth muscle to me, but uh, so I'm imagining that we're in an artery of some sort. You can help me out here, David. Yeah, 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 yeah. The lumen's on the far left. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, you see yeah. the internal elastic lamina really nicely, right, David? Yeah. Yeah. This? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then that kind of bluish, uh, grayish, uh, change is the mucoid uh, intimal edema. Okay. And that's significant for what exactly? Uh, it's a histological feature of, of, of TMA. Okay. Okay. So uh, the immunofluorescence is negative. I'm assuming that's everything. Include uh, C3. Include, yeah, C3 and IgA, which was on the differential, but it wouldn't have been this... Uh, pattern. Um, and now we have a lower power, I mean, although an EM is extremely high power, it's kind of a lower power EM. And again, just like the light microscopy, we don't have a lumen here. Uh, so if we trace our glomerular based membrane, it's here, the podocytes would be on the outside, our endothelial cell should be on the inside here, and, and then you'd have a lumen, but uh, extremely swollen endothelial cell. Uh, yeah, and, and that, that is a mesangial area with, with mesangial lysis. Uh, 
the, yeah, right there is a lumen. I think those are some fragmented red cells there. Yeah, and here. then okay. yeah, yeah, right there. That was one lumen. And if you move to the right of that, you have mesangiolysis. Yeah, and then up here that you can see that I mean we'll see a higher power, but the podocytes look good, the GBM looks good, but there's just this endothelial cell nucleus, yes. nucleus yeah. that's really, really taking yeah. over everything. Um, okay. And again, higher power. Here's our GBM. There's no immune deposits in it. Our podocytes are preserved. Uh, and we just we really don't have a lumen. So here's a red cell fragment again, just based on color. And this must be the endothelial cell nucleus. And this this whole thing is just endothelial cell here. Yeah, and the, uh, there's a loss of uh, endothelial cell fenestrations as well. Mm. Yeah, and there's just no there's no lumen there at all. Yeah. Um, Podocytes look preserved. Yeah. Uh, again, podocytes are okay. Here's our GBM, uh, and this is just again completely swollen here. No real. Yeah. Lumen. yeah so uh, nicely on the capillary on the left, there's some sub endothelial flocculent material. Yeah. Are right about this yeah, here. Right there. Okay. Yeah. 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 So sort of yeah. a, a lucency, not really a. Yeah. Um, it's 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 not the normal density of our glomerular based membrane. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's swelling, electron lucent widening, um, and that uh, flocculent material. Okay. Loss of fenestrations. Right. Right. Uh, I would check our pregnancy test. <laughs> so so this is uh, endotheliosis. <laughs> it's glomerular. Uh, Glomerular endotheliosis uh, that that obviously is the hallmark sign for preeclampsia or eclampsia. But um, since we don't have that, we will probably have to discuss what the etiology is. So uh, David brought up, you know, the term TMA. Did you see any thrombi? No, I didn't see any thrombi. I didn't see any open capillary loops, but it was endothelial cells that were blocking them more than thrombi. So there's certainly an endothelial pathogen here. Um, I don't know if that... Uh, artery that you showed me had was if if we would have had the entire lumen if there would have been a thrombosis there but from what i saw i did not see an actual yeah yeah no no thrombi uh, no in the biopsy yeah. so it's a ma yeah. so let me but ask you, you one thing uh because i i am puzzled uh these um subendothelial accumulation of flocculent material has that also been described in preeclampsia? I thought not, but I don't know. I, I'm going to defer to yeah, uh, yeah, David right, right. Here. I mean, that this is all this is all kind of uh, pathognomonic for endotheliosis, uh, as as Dr. Whittier nicely described. All right. I would have called it TMA, though. I'd, you, we don't need thrombi uh, for thrombotic microangiopathy. So, um, I'm sorry, Tiffany. Oh, but one question I had, um, because you did show some mucoid entomal edema of a vessel, but I couldn't tell if there's really any significant luminal stenosis. It was um, tangential if that was really a microangiopathic change or not. But was there any like onion skinning or um, uh, arteriolar changes? No, no, that um, th this was the only change uh, in the biopsy. Uh, there were, if you go actually back a couple slides, you could see some arterioles. Uh, I was going to, right, right there oh, okay. at six o'clock. Um, yeah, that's an arterial, looks normal. And on the next glomerulus to the left, there's another arterial uh, that was completely normal as well. So, so that then, helps us being glomerular centric. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Dr. Kazem said this very, very quickly. Says so you don't need a throm you don't need a thrombus to have it in a TMA. You don't need a T for TMA, and 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 Bill said it's an MA, and that's a little different than we've kind of classically thought about. So I think I'm going to hand it over to, to Dr. Abaxi to kind of discuss this concept of uh, what is what are we dealing with? Should we should we, you know, are, are we we call everything by a pattern of injury now? This is almost a a, a, a new way of thinking about a pattern of injury. Uh, Prevere. Yep, I'm going to take it back in me a second here. Um, let's see. So, yeah, I mean, this is uh, kind of where we were. Oops, let me change my screen. All right, should be able to see that. Oh, uh, the, in the chat, it said what was in the liver biopsy? Any uh, 
Yeah, so I ha let me go. I have a slide right after this showing right. kind of the updated information on on some of the questions there. And so, um, yeah, the blood pressure was normal. And so this kind of goes back, I, and I just put them this in there because this is kind of what I remember when I was training. And when we saw something with thrombocytopenia and concern for MAHA or micro, uh, you know, mangiavic uh, kinolytic anemia, the three things that you would go down to are, well, is it TTP? And you would base it all off of clinical findings, right? If they have altered mental status and AKI, you know, thrombocytopenia, TTP. If they had diarrhea, if it was, you know, bloody diarrhea, you think about sugar toxin, HUS, and the whole other, if it wasn't one of those two, then it was atypical HUS. And, and I think that's how it started. And unfortunately, a lot of things got grouped into just being called atypical HUS. And I think, unfortunately, that's, that's kind of continued. When you look at where we are now, this has evolved much more. Uh, and I think we have much better understanding of this, and this continues to grow. And the way really, you know, to approach these patients now uh, when you're concerned with, uh, you know, TMA is not just, you know, TTP, you know, HUS or atypical HUS, but kind of thinking about, you know, is it a primary hereditary, primary acquired, secondary or infection related TMA? Uh, and, and this is, you know, a lot of things we talk about and we've seen some of these in biopsy conference, but, you know, there's of course our acquired ones uh, and the classic TTP with Adams TS13 autoantibody. And in these, again, we, we start plasmapheresis anytime we're considering a, a, a TTP because of the removal of autoantibody. There's also a, a category of what falls into, you know, primary TP, TMA that's acquired, and that's due to a, a factor H autoantibody. And this would can be characterized as a, you know, atypical HUS. But kind of thinking about them as primary and secondary, I think is a start. And, it, and it's much more, it's much more, um, appropriate than our old classification. Now, the thing that comes into some of these things is that a lot of these secondary TMAs, there is now debate if they have some underlying genetic predisposition, if they have an underlying genetic complement dysregulation that predisposes them. And so there's another trigger to set off this cascade of events. And, and that's something we've discussed before. And I know that's something that's also becoming in, uh, popular and gaining stream, especially with the ones we have severe hypertension or uh, some of these other uh, drug-induced ones. Um, but, you know, that's a category we've seen. And finally, we have infection associated TMA. Uh, and you can add, this is from 2018, pre-COVID, you can add COVID on there because we've also had cases of COVID causing endotheliosis and TMA. So, you know, this is a, a much a better way to look at it. Um, and what's important for our patient, of course, she did have infection. Um, and, you know, that was the major thing. She didn't have any of these other autoimmune things that we knew of. She didn't have hypertension. Um, you know, she wasn't on classic drugs there associated with TMA. So it becomes that, did she have some infection and have some underlying uh, in, uh, genetic predisposition, which we'll get to. Coming more to the pathology of things. So, and I think Dr. Kaza brought this up. You don't have to have and thrombi, thrombi to call something TMA. And that's another area where I think we'll see more changing of the guard in when looking at these TMA. So classically, of course, we think of thrombotic microangiopathy as, you know, our tissue responding to endothelial injury and as kind of a spectrum of injury, we, a spectrum of the injury we get thrombi, uh, you know, in, in, in the vessels. Well, a lot of these cases, you don't see a thrombosis. And so what are some of the pathological features that we, uh, histopathological features that we see? Well, some of them we saw today in this case, endothelial swelling, um, and, and you can get mesangiolysis. Uh, of course, thrombi is what every, everyone kind of singles into, but you know, it's again, it's not always there. Uh, in terms of more chronic, then you have to kind of group it as active versus chronic. In chronic, we brought this up today, is if it's someone has a chronic TMA, you might start seeing some double contours, um, mesangial interposition. You'll see uh, this new subendothelial sub basement getting uh, put down. So, you know, I think remembering that, you know, that there's a spectrum of different lesions that we see in, 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 in so-called TMA is helpful moving forward and really reclassifying these cases into micro microangiopathy with thrombi or without thrombosis. Uh, Dr. Kaz, anything further to add? I guess this is I'm definitely much more your specialty than mine, but anything to further add on you know the, the histopathology part of things? No, this sounds great to me. Okay. And what about the presence of fibrin on immunofluorescence? Is that helpful? 
and immunofluorescence. Uh, I'm not sure, I, uh, David or Tiffany, any, uh, I, I'm not sure if just immunofluorescence fibrin, I usually think of that as more fibrinoid, you know, active inflammation and fibrinoid necrosis, but. Yeah, the reason I'm asking <laughs> is uh, Helmut Reinke is a big proponent of doing uh, IF for fibrin uh, because he finds it helpful in cases of endothelial injuries such as this one. But I, I assume it was negative. In, I assume the fibrin was negative in this case. It was not reported. Oh, I, th I thought all IF was negative. Did they? Have, yeah. Did we, did yeah. 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 There, there was no fibrin in the glomeruli. Okay. Right. And back to the original question: What about positive fibrin? Is that helpful at all? I find it helpful for actually arterioles. Um, more more so than within glomeruli, um, because it's it's easy to miss, you know, very focal microangiopathic changes, but they they frequently will stain for for fibrin when you when you have thrombi. Um, it it's useful in the glomeruli when you're determining fibrinoid necrosis versus, or it can be confusing within glomeruli if you're worried about fibrinoid necrosis versus um, thrombi. But it's the company that it keeps. There's the underlying microangiopathic changes. But yeah, we definitely use fibrinogen to help them. Darby's saying that this is this is not endothelio, this is endotheliosis under the umbrella of TMA. So is is preeclamptic lesion a TMA based on this table? I would think so. Yeah. I think it's a spectrum yes. of injury. Yeah. I, I think it's spectrum of changes that you see. And you know ultimately, you know, it would be maybe the better term would be, you know, the, I guess, histological or pathophysiology would be, you know, microangiopathy uh, without thrombosis if you're not seeing thrombi. And that would include endothelial swelling and endotheliosis. Am I correct, in, uh, Dr. Kaza, Dr. Uh, Simbolok? Yeah, we are, actually, uh, we had a case of a 50-year-old guy with um, endotheliosis that we presented 2015 or 2016 in our biopsy conference. And I, I wrote it up as a case report and uh, I mean, uh, endotheliosis is re re represents a, a variant uh, of TMA. I think uh, I think the language has to get rid of the T and yeah. just call it, you know, yeah. microangiopathy yeah. with, with or without thrombi. I mean, I think that's if that that's what I'm getting out of this is that we we focus too much on the T part of this. This is really an endothelial damage, and then you can see you know you can see swelling, you can see thrombi, you can see all kinds of stuff. I and see Tiffany's Tiffany's shaking her head, so I. You just, uh, my day's been made. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah. on top of that, you know, the, the problem here is that we don't see thrombi, and, and this is something we also dealt with is, well, this is not TMA, and, and that has therapeutic, you know, implications, uh, especially if we're going down a complement-mediated TMA process where acuzumab could be used and, and can definitely get patients off of uh, dialysis. So, you know, the lack of thrombi should not sway you away from a microangiopathy that could be still complement dysregulation. I think that's, I think what I'm trying to get across. And that's what I learned from this case, at least. The other aspect that was interesting of this case uh, was, you know, there was a normal haptoglobin, there was a uh, normal LD, LDH. We saw schistocytes in the kidney biopsy. We didn't see any peripheral schistocytes. Uh, mm -hmm. The platelets were maybe mildly low, 100, 120, nothing too low and, and the hemoglobin was a little low and, and I think uh, Dr. Glassica brought that up it, you know the anemia out of proportion of you know what was going on and and so I think the other big part of understanding these patients who have these findings of microangiopathy is that you know a lot of them don't need to have the classic systemic findings and this was a nice uh, letter that was just published in 2022 and it was done through a group uh, in Wisconsin and in Mayo Clinic including Dr. Nasser and they basically looked at you know their their biopsies these were native kidney biopsies they had 128 of them they went back and looked at patients who were had diagnosed uh, angiopathy or thrombotic microangiopathy they looked for both terms and they they found that if you look here and this, they define, they further subdivided them into glomerular TMA, which had primarily glomerular TMA findings or vascular uh, findings. And this is all of them. Only 43% actually had peripheral schistocytes. So that's not a good reliable marker to say if someone has TMA or not, or microangiopathy, I should say. Uh, not all of them had LDA, elevated LDHs. 
even a lower amount uh, had low haptoglobins and you know just about 50 percent actually had thrombocytopenia so this is quite something that we have seen before and has been done and, and published in renal limited tma especially in patients who have you know, transplants or uh, bone marrow transplants, we see a lot of renal TMAs. I've seen a couple with Dr. Gashdi recently, which have no systemic features of, you know, microangiopathy. And we do a kidney biopsy and sure enough, they have renal limited TMA, which again, changes our implications and treatment management for these patients. Uh, on the right here is another graph. They looked at, these are patients who had, you know, some autoimmune or complement mediated hypertension microangiopathy. And again, looking at these patients, you know, the frequency of them having schistocytes and, and renal thrombi uh, especially was not 100%. So this goes back to find that not all of these patients have renal thrombi. Um, and even more, less, and in, in these are the group that had, uh, you know, either uh, paraprotein related or other malignancies. So I think the take-home point on this one is that, you know, thrombi, don't need to be there and, and don't rely on the extra renal lab markers of LDH, haptoglobin, and schistocytes to make a determination if someone has uh, a microangiopathy. I got a quick thing to add. Mm -hmm. um, as far as um, schistocytes, a lot of um, CBCs with differential is um, done automated and the slides aren't actually looked at by a pathologist. And so if you have patients that um, your concern that they have just the site's manual review of the slides is probably going to increase your sensitivity substantially. Um, it's going to be lab dependent. I agree that not all of them are going to have systemic manifestations, but they can easily be missed on algorithms. Looks like this case, they're all in the kidney biopsy. They haven't gotten to the blood yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I now... Um, uh, let me update maybe, you know, I can update, you know, what we had and I give me a second here of what other information, um, you know, was returned back to me, uh, some of the questions that were asked. So, you know, oops. Um, so here we go. It, it, the Coombs test was negative. The Adams TS-13 actively did become normal. Uh, it was normal. And this was done pre-plasmapheresis. Um, uh, if, you know, that's something you have to make sure you check. RNA polymerase activity uh, was negative. Factor H autoantibody was negative. Antiphospholipid syndrome antibody was negative. People had asked about the liver biopsy. Uh, there was no fibrosis, believe it or not. And, and really it was read as kind of not really helpful for this case. Uh, and so it had minimal sinusoidal vascular congestion. And, and per the report, that had not much significance um, and so the lower biopsy was not really helpful here. Complement testing, um, I know genetic testing uh, gets brought up. That was still pending. Uh, and we did repeat a peripheral smear that was looked at by our hematologist, at, as Dr. Kaza said, and, and they still did not find any cystocytes. All right, so we're going to do a poll, um, poll number two. Based on what you've seen so far in our discussion, what, how would you treat this patient? So. Uh, this is all with steroids. So number one is steroids and Plex alone, or steroids and rituximab alone, steroids and ecluizumab alone. Number four, steroids, Plex, and rituximab, or number five, steroids, Plex, and ecluizumab, or six other, which includes, uh, I don't know, prayer. Or nothing. I suppose other could be if you want to just watch the patient or if you think it's, you know, over. So please vote. And uh, Prevere, while they're voting, did you, was there B12 also? Because I think that was on there, cobalamin, and it was on the differential. Uh, that was the normal. Okay. Yeah. Uh, give me one second. Uh... Poll's not open. No one's voting. There we go. Now you okay. should be able to vote. Okay. Please vote, everybody. We'll see what people want to, want to do. And then I'm going to hand it over to Bill for a little more background uh, from his experience uh, with something similar. Which yeah, I, I, um, I was thinking about this as we were going through here. And so I, you know, I, was, I, I may pull up some slides after this, if, uh, if that's okay. Well, yeah, get them ready. Okay. So I know you, 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 David alluded to it, but uh, we had a case that's somewhat, somewhat similar, I guess. All right. So let's see. Um, Majority chose steroids, plasma freezes, and eclusimab, 42%. Uh, there was kind of almost a, you know, the second 
highest one was steroids and plex. Uh, third was steroids and cluzumab, and not far fourth was steroids, plex, and rituximab. Um, not the other had really low, so the majority chose kind of steroids, plex, and cluzumab. Yeah, Dr. Glassick asked about tucolizumab. No, oh, I can't even say it. You could just say Tosi. Tosi, thank you, Bill. <laughs> you could have you could have read it for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah Tosi, exactly. That's why we call it Tosi. I and, mean, uh, it's a good, it's an interesting thought. Yeah, Tosi is a great idea because this is really a capillary leak. I mean, this is, um, you know, and that's what we're using for capillary leak syndrome after the, some of these um, oncologic uh, things and all that. So we, yeah, we had uh, David allude to this. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. And you want to put it full screen? Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'll just jump to it. We, I had the um, same case or endotheliosis, but it was in a man. And, and this brought up what this was brought up the pathophysiology of preeclampsia and given some talks on this, but, but interestingly, it really is a, um, a TMA, like we were saying is, um, let me see if, it, yeah, like there's all these causes of TMA, but this uh, S split inhibiting VEGF and plus it, all endothelial cells are all considered to be part of this uh, TMA. And so uh, Dr. Robbie and I actually went down to Arcana, and I'm not sure if Tiffany was there at the time. Um, Tiffany, were you there or? Yeah, remember, it's crazy, but, um, yes. And so, <laughs> yeah, this we, we came down and presented a case down there, and um, and and presented this to your sort of biopsy conference of an endothelial cell uh, swelling, and you could almost <laughs> I'm not going to reread the pathology, but it was pretty darn similar uh, with the with um, oh, basically it was this man who had this sort of uh, mesangial. Oh, sorry, with this endothelial cell uh, swollen appearance. And so we had termed it a man with preeclampsia when obviously it wasn't that, it was just some sort of idiopathic uh, uh, endotheliosis. And in really, in real time, I did not know what to do when I had my case. We, uh, I gave him uh, prednisone right after the biopsy and then I gave him rituxan because what else was there to do? Uh, this was also 2016, ecoluzumab wasn't really an in thing at the time. And he was just getting worse and worse. So we threw plasmapheresis at him. And as soon as that happened, his swelling, his serositis, he diuresed like crazy, his basically his capillary leak, you know, completely went away. And this just kind of brought up the idea that we were freezing off something that wasn't necessarily inflammatory that would have responded to prednisone or rituxan, but we we're freezing this molecule. And at the same time was when all the S-split stuff was coming up with, with preeclampsia. And this looked like preeclampsia, uh, you know, and, and, it made sense that prednisone wasn't helping. It was acting like preeclampsia. It's just that the guy was a guy. Um, and so, you know, this was some of the other studies where the treatment of preeclampsia, where you, they looked at uh, S split on the adsor adsorption columns, and they did have prolongation of, um, of time of uh, pregnancy before they needed to deliver. Obviously, treatment of preeclampsia is still delivery of the placenta. But if you can't deliver that yet and you want to still uh, keep, fetal viability going, then you might need to prolong it. And so that's what the, this is looking at as sort of early preeclampsia treatments. And this is what the plasma absorption column did is it removed S split and then it removed it again. And then again, it removed it, it removed it again. And it was able to prolong this person's pregnancy by 21 days. Um, and so we actually had looked at in pregnancy, whether plasmapheresis removes S split and what it does to S split in uh, uh, placental growth factor as well. And we found in a different patient that needed to be phoresed for a different reason. I think she had a neurologic condition who happened to be pregnant. We'd looked at her S split levels before and after her phoresis and found out that they immediately dropped and uh, they were in the effluent. And then there's a, re a sustained reduction at two hours compared to the placental growth factor, which immediately dropped, but then at two hours came back up because with plasmapheresis, you may be removing all of them at the same level, and then you're not really uh, fixing the angiogenic balance. And so we sh showed here that that might be a, a role for something like plasmapheresis. But really, the kind of really cool thing that came out after all the machines for removal of S-flit was this siRNA blocker. And it's not uh, in humans yet, but when they put this uh, RNA S-flit blocker into baboons who were pregnant uh, and hypertensive, and preeclamptic, they uh, uh, put this S-split blocker in. So the pl placenta was still in the patient, obviously. The baby was still in the patient, but they were able to block S-splits release. And they noticed that the, the um, blood pressure got better, the proteinuria got better. They stabilized the preeclampsia all through really hitting S-split. So I don't know. I think S-split's like really a great idea of uh, marker of endotheliosis, but it's important to remember that 
Esplit's not the only evil enemy here. We have a lot of um, um, a lot of different uh, possibilities of what other molecules are. And so you've got indiglin, which might be partially responsible, and that's why preeclampsia has completely changed terms right now. You can't, you don't even have to have proteinuria to have preeclampsia. You just have to have hypertension and some sort of capillary leak somewhere. Most commonly, of course, that's in the kidney with proteinuria. But you can have hypertension with capillary leak in the lungs, and we're, and there's no renal failure, there's no proteinuria at all, and they're calling that preeclampsia. And so I just like the idea of uh, stabilizing the endothelial cell, and I love the idea of TOSI. I'm, it, it'd be off label. It'd be you know, there's no standard treatments for any of this, but something that would be blocking capillary leak. I mean, we did it post COVID for our patients, and we do it in our bone marrow transplant patients after CAR T therapy and things like that. So, uh, I think that makes the most sense as something to block capillary leak. It would be this one. You know, this person has something on this spectrum. I know they don't have a placenta but they have some damage to their endothelial cell that's causing a variety of these symptoms and, and blocking that would be the goal. It doesn't seem like prednisone or rituxan would do anything, but I certainly would freeze, you know, freezing some evil humor uh, if I was asked what to do in the situation. So Bill, you're not sure if your uh, rituximab had any role in your patient getting better? Yes, I don't know. I, all I know is that long-term after this therapy that I gave, he, this is like 10 years later, I still see him once a year, he's completely normal. He had some huge event that caused all this capillary leak, and he was in his lungs. It was in his abdomen. It was just like this patient. Phoresis took it all away, or maybe rituxan and maybe steroids. I have no idea, but I see him annually, and he is completely normal. Normal renal function, no proteinuria, no hematuria. Everything's completely normal. So it, it presented as a capillary leak, but it really had an endothelial, uh, endothelial diffuse endothelial damage of some type that we were that you identified or we identified through the renal biopsy. Correct. Yeah, and it looked just like endotheliosis, and he wasn't. Yes. and he wasn't. Yeah. He wasn't pregnant. He didn't have cancer, and he didn't have. Chemotherapy. And, and he was just like this case. He had seri he had what looked like capillary leak everywhere. I mean, he had. I don't think our patient here had it in the lungs, maybe because you said the chest X-ray was normal. But mm -hmm. there's ascites. There was just fluid everywhere uh, in my patient. It was brought up here that uh, you know if this is how, however similar this might be, that uh, that COVID you know brought it on, and there might be a complement deficiency. That's you, right. Looking back, do you see it? In retrospect, was thinking about a two-hit model, was there anything that proceeded with this with your patient, or did I wasn't listening? Or for for my patient, yeah, or for, for your patient, Bill? I'm sorry. Oh no, that's okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, my uh, no, am I? Well, this was again before COVID, uh, but there wasn't sort of any sort of viral. That's what I'm saying. Uh, yes, no viral illness prior to, and you know, we did all this testing that we could uh, at the time. Yeah, and Dr. Radvi, uh, I have a comment. Did you know? around it to them up. To me, it looks like it was the COVID is definitely playing a role. There is some angiogenesis and he has high ferritin. So he may have some sort of cytokine and storm leading to endotheliosis. So to them up is actually a very good idea in this patient. That's really interesting. I learned something. I didn't really, I've never thought about that pathway, but I think that's, uh, that's really interesting. It's certainly a lot uh, cheaper than eclusimab and and plus, no, I don't know about that. Tosi is pretty expensive too. <laughs> is it? Well, yeah. but do you but do you do you continue it for you know? I mean, eclizumab is going to be going for a while in this patient. So right. Um, this is a one time hit. You know, maybe you can just uh, temporize it for a while. Um, now there's a new test that's now available. Looking at uh, that just came out. Um, looking at Sflit and. Uh, um, yeah, it just, well, it's been around for a while and I think it's the S flip placental growth factor ratio. And again, this is in pregnancy to determine preeclampsia as the cause of proteinuria versus other proteinuric diseases. So uh, not necessarily in this case, but it, this case, you know, you do think that something like S flip may be abnormal. Even no, I mean, if your, if your hypothesis is correct, I mean, that mm -hmm. what you did with, you know, was to restore angiogenic balance, as you put it by uh, removing, you know, selectively removing that that maybe that's a possibility i mean it would be great test to run on someone who's not pregnant who has it. it's just that this Absolutely. is just not a common condition we've seen too in you know our history now um and in america that test has not really been widely available at all except for research labs and that's when we sent ours off to research labs but i know in other countries it is available but i just I think this week on on twitter uh, the, the fda just approved its use for routine testing for preeclampsia. So I'm excited to get some use out of it, but I don't know if any of the people that are on from different countries have any experience of using the S-flip placental growth factor ratios or any of these uh, 
angiogenic balance factors in, in pregnancy. Dr. Reen, is it available in Canada? No, not yet. Oh, well, Dr. Retail, would you do VEGF level in these kind of patients? Would that have any role in that? Yeah, I mean, it's it, that's that's the pathway, right? Um, yeah, um, and I think that I think that would help. I, I don't know if again, I don't know how easy it is to get that test. So uh, we're we're running over a little bit. I'm going to hand it back to Prevere. You want to tell us what you did, uh, Prevere? Yeah, and so sure enough, as I mentioned, she got started on dialysis. This is when she came to us. Each of these boxes represents one day, and this is the creatinine in time. So we did, uh, once we got the biopsy results, she was already starting dialysis. Uh, we started her on plasma phoresis and we did it daily. Uh, and you can see, and also she did get steroids as well, uh, high dose steroids. So dialysis, you know, we did multiple times and this was really uh, primarily to help with her volume overload and um, her, I mean, her creatinine and BUN were going up. Over time, her creatinine did come down. And after, you know, discussing with our colleagues, hematology and kind of explaining what was said on the kidney biopsy, uh, we were able to get a cluzumab and she did get one dose prior to leaving the hospital. She's following with an outside, you know, uh, nephrologist given just, you know, proximity to her home, but the plan is to continue cluzumab. We did send off the complement studies. Those are still pending. So the genetic testing is pending. I will say, you know, with something that, to me in this case, what it was is, and I think Dr. Reen mentions this too, I, I think the infection set something off, but I think she had some underlying genetic predisposition. Uh, you know, it's interesting she got so much better with, you know, plasmapheresis. Now that may have been that little mild ATN uh, and she had maybe a little AIN too, I think we saw too. And, you know, that would get treated, maybe that was from the steroids and we had, sorry, the NSAIDs and we treated with steroids. But, you know, I wonder if she had some other acquired uh, cause, uh, or did she have a genetic hereditary thing predispositioning her? Because in the pregnancy also, she had some proteinuria, and 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 of course that was that term, but I, I wonder if she's just higher risk for developing something like endotheliosis from a complement dysregulation. So that's my theory on it. Um, I, I think we're still waiting for some tests, but the good news is she went home without dialysis. Um, the steroids are being tapered, and she's getting weekly occlusimab for now. I think timing. it's a great theory, and I like I like the pregnancy clue there, whether it's real or not. I mean, it, you know, it 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 really plays into your story really really well. It'll be interesting to see when the studies do come back. You know, what what what's your decision going to be? I mean, even if somebody has a complement deficiency, they go thirty five. She went thirty five years without a problem. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean she needs to be on a clozumab forever. And it'll be you know you have to make a decision when to stop it, and that'll be you know some clinical decision. But it's. It's not something that you, you know, that you might have to do forever. The uh, problem is, is the genetic testing being negative and that doesn't, that makes it more complicated. Then, and then, then what do you do? You well, know, at some point you'll stop it and see. You have to stop it at some point. I really do like the idea that this was induced by something because she gets along fine and then, you know, and you'll just see, you can follow her carefully and, mm -hmm. and go from there. Um, so, you know, we've come, you know, we're, we're starting to really embrace the uh, pattern of injury now it's pattern of nomenclature because I think we have to drop the T part of it. I think that's really a, a very, because it really can throw us off and not even, not necessarily think about microangiopathy as well, but uh, it's a tricky case and it explains it really. Getting back to what, you know, Melanie's uh, uh, um, uh, PAN diagnosis, you really need something that's gonna, that, that's gonna give you AKI without really much in the urine. You know, when I described this case in Twitter, I said, it's really a bland urine. Um, and usually that kind of gets you out of the glomerular pathology uh, form. But here's a really good example of, you know, with the glomerular, if all the capillaries are completely plugged up with swelling, uh, you're not going to have much of a GFR. So I think it's a, it's a remarkable case with a remarkable response. And I appreciate everybody here that, that, that joined in because I learned a heck of a lot today. Um, and uh, Dr. Koss, thank you for, so much for joining us. Uh, um, any other comments? Anybody? Me. Go ahead. Fun. Yeah, thank you. She says we've seen some cases of. Oh, you want to you want to just explain that? Yeah, so endotheliosis uh, or like glomerular predominant TMA, we've seen it in the setting of envenomation. So snake or scorpion bites. Um, we had a collaborator from India give us a talk that snake bites are a common etiology for this pattern in India, and we've seen a few cases here too. <laughs> Very rare, but you're looking at a rare bird now too. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we see many scorpion bites uh, or viper bites here, but um, 
I know that, you know, they still see uh, cortical necrosis in India, which is, you know, even a, the most severe form of, mm. of uh, microangiopathy from, you know, a complete uh, activation of the, of, a thromba, of the thromba system. Okay, thanks, everybody. Uh, uh, we, uh, we'll add those people uh, from the list into our email list. And it, again, let us know if you're not added and join our uh, YouTube channel. And uh, we'll be in touch. Everybody stay safe.